Welcome to DOS Boat, season three. If you watched the first two seasons, you know what this is all about. We find an old boat, something cheap with scars in history, then pass it around to the most interesting and brave anglers we know and explore some of the country's most unique fisheries. I'm Joe Cermelli, and I'm taking over this show from my boss, Stephen Ranella, this season. Now, I've fished all over the world, but I cut my teeth as an angler here in the Northeast. My mission sounded simple, at least on paper. Find a boat with genuine craftsmanship and intrinsic value and get it seaworthy in a month so it could hit the road while all the best Northeast fisheries were in full swing. There's so many levels of used boat at the Jersey Shore, right? There's boat yards full of these things. There's so many in backyards, and you know it's out there somewhere. I've never seen a center console when they put them cooler seats in. It's got some crunch. It may not look like much, but this 1973 center console Mako is a classic, man. Oh, well, let's see what we got here, man. Its bones are good, even if the deck is rotten, the electrical shot, and it just needs like a ridiculous amount of work before we can put it on the wall. This foot has no idea how lucky it is. Not only is it getting redecked, but like this thing's been sitting for God knows how long, and now it's going to go on one hell of an adventure. Going under the board. Oh, I can't even believe that just happened. That's what I've been waiting for. There we go. Bigger boat, bigger challenges, bigger water, same bad idea. This is Das Boat Northeast. Lake Erie is arguably the best trophy walleye fishery in the U.S. But in the 1960s and 70s, industrial waste, sewage, and chemicals from Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and Ontario poured into Lake Erie, turning what was once a pristine fishery into a virtual dead zone. But in one of our country's greatest climate action stories. Grassroots activism started shifting public opinion. And in October of 1972, the Clean Water Act finally passed, creating federal legislation to dramatically reduce contamination of our country's rivers and lakes. After massive overhauls to municipal waste treatment plants and industrial regulation, Lake Erie slowly came back. And as the water cleaned up, stocking efforts eventually transformed the lake into one of the greatest walleye fisheries in the country. Certified donkey, I don't care where you're at. That's worth the trip right and there. And the best walleye fisherman in this part of the country, at least according to him, is my old buddy, Captain Ross Robertson. I've been fishing with the Conan O'Brien of Port Clinton, Ohio, where we're stationed for this rodeo for a little over a decade now. I love a fish that can feed a family. <laughs> we go way back. And while I love the dude like a brother, our relationship is rooted in a constant exchange of off-color commentary and straight ball busting. This thing couldn't go through an airport detector. I didn't tell it's you about just <laughs> kind of what we do. Ross is also a man that loves his shiny new sled with all its newfangled electronics and gizmos. So I'm not gonna lie, forcing him to flex his world-famous walleye skills on this old beater Mako gives me pleasure. That is 19 feet of awesome. <laughs> Come oh. on, man. You do realize we fished together and had a lot of success. I mean, you're, we really have to leave this in the garage? I know you want to use baby. I get it. But I got to tell you, man, I've kind of bonded with this boat. It's, it's been a long journey. I haven't seen it in a while or run it in a while now. It's, uh, it's bonded with 5200. I like it's bonded with 5200. We've got a, this is a project. It's going to be a long day. I know, I know this boat. I trust this boat. It's going to be fun. You just catch the walleyes. Yeah, I mean, we're going we're gonna to rig this thing up so we can do some trolling because it's hot as all get up, middle of the summer, we've got to go fast. And That's this... terrific, because I love walleye trolling. You know, <laughs> high level excitement. <laughs> you like results, and that's what we're going to get. Let's get this out of here. In case you missed the sarcasm I just laid on pretty thick, I don't get excited by walleye trolling. Anyway, first thing we have nope. to do 
is get rid of all the janky <laughs> kayak mounts so that Ross can install a rail system to hold all his rod trees and whatever else he needs to get our boat performing as close as possible to his boat. Should we have like safety equipment or something on? And of course it would be me in the end that has to undo all that 5200 adhesive. While I crowbar off these kayak mounts, Ross is going to measure out mounting points on the gunnel so that he can install the track system. The amount of rods Ross takes on the boat and pulls during a trolling session would make the guys fishing the white marlin open blush. But I'm not gonna argue with anything he wants on this boat because walleye are his world. And as much as I crack on him, he is a master of it. Dude, that's it, Joe. That's all the tracks we need. For that. What else do we have to do to make this walleye ready? We gotta power this thing up. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough juice to run everything. Okay. So we're gonna put that big giant Dakota Lithium 136 volt battery, which weighs about as much as this drill. It's so light up in the front. We're gonna strap that in as a backup and then we're gonna put one underneath there. So we got plenty of power for the grass. We've got that giant transducer out there. It's awesome, I use it too, but I have it higher into my boat so it doesn't create a disturbance because we're just gonna have this tiny little deal down there. Okay. And what, what is the difference in transducer? Why do we need your transducer? That big giant one, that Mega 360 is awesome, but when you put it down in the water, that thing kicks up tons of disturbance. This is, this is the money maker. Right. This is how I make my living on this $50 transducer. We've got to find these fish. It may only be two, 300 yards long out there in the middle of nowhere. But without this, you wouldn't be able to do that. This is the easiest way to find fish on big open bodies of water. Look at that. Joe, this is like it was meant to be there. You know what we created? What? A walleye catching machine. Tomorrow I'm gonna to mold you like a lump of clay into a walleye slayer. Since I know that Ross hates missing an opportunity to self-promote, I figured I'd do him a solid and throw his charter logo on the Mako as a finishing touch, just so all his fanboys and girls out there in their flashy boats know damn well that it's Ross freaking Robertson riding around in this old tub. Before I get out and spend all day letting Ross yell at me for improper walleye form, I want to know more about a unique situation unfolding here that lots of anglers are talking about. With a wildly successful stocking program, Lake Erie is brimming with walleyes that fall into the just legal category, making it a lot tougher to find that trophy walleye magic Erie was famous for. Maybe too much of a good thing isn't so good after all. I know that you already know a lot about the biology and the science of these fish, but I'm looking forward to hearing it. I know, I know that Ohio is doing some crazy stuff with these walleyes. It's evolving so fast, just like fishing electronics, you know, yeah. technology that you, if you think you know, you're already behind because it's, you know, putting some of the science and the numbers together with what you think you know as a guide or a guide that's on the water all the time. That's cool stuff, man. So we take a little trip from home base in Port Clinton and head to Sandusky, Ohio, just to the east to drop in on Ross's buddy, Eric Weimer at the Lake Erie Fisheries Research Station. Eric, how many years have you known Ross? Oh, it's been longer than he probably thinks. Yeah. I think I met him. How many years did you have to know him before he became tolerable? And well, you were like, not like, oh, I shit. I don't know if I've gotten guy. him yet, have I? Tolerable yeah. is a unique word. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're not tolerable, yeah, but you no. think you are. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, this is true. <laughs> this, this is his scene. This is where he fishes. He knows a lot of the things that you already know. I'm, I'm the outsider here that's just completely not schooled on the, the entire walleye program in this lake. Well, then I'll be able to impress you. Okay, yeah. you already have, <laughs> so you haven't told me anything yet. Well, the, the estimated walleye population in 2021 is 95 million uh, adults. So those are two-year-olds and older. So that doesn't count anything uh, that hatched last year or this year. So it's, it's a really large walleye population right now. We've, we've uh, benefited from some really outstanding walleye hatches in 2015, 2018, and 2019. And frankly, last year's wasn't anything to, to thumb your nose at. So I think it's safe to say that, that right now we are in one of the heydays of walleye fishing on Lake Erie. Fair to say from an economic standpoint, walleyes are the most important fish in Lake Erie. I think that's safe to say. Um, there are yes, <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're. I, I, that's why I didn't ask you. Economically speaking, in Ohio, um, just fishing on Lake Erie in general is about a 1.3 billion dollar uh, boost to our economy here. 
Um, and that's just Ohio waters. Right. And a lot of that is walleye driven. Now he was telling me that you guys, you do an acoustic study, right? Basically, yeah. you guys know where the bulk of the fish are sort of at all times. Do I have that right? We, we have um, for about 10 years been doing acoustic telemetry work in, the, in Lake Erie. We insert uh, an acoustic transmitter. Mm -hmm. We surgically implant that into the body cavity of the walleye and we send them out. And uh, as they travel, they come across uh, receivers that we've deployed on the bottom of the lake in a grid pattern, cover most of Lake Erie. And when we collect those receivers, we can download that into a, a, a huge database and start making heads or tails of the data. Yeah, the cool thing is this is public information. It's not real time, but like last year, sure. like I watched this stuff and I'm like, oh my God, yeah, because I look back at my calendar, I'm like, hey, I was fishing in this general vicinity and you just see, so like he said, I mean, they're not all there. Like some of the stuff that I've learned is they're fish that literally spawn near a shoal or a rock pile and don't go more than a few miles. And then there's some that, you know, migrate 100 plus miles. I don't know if there's a rhyme or reason, they're just kind of like people. Me and you, very different. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's great information and to see how these things stay the same but yet change so much. Sure. I know I've learned a lot with this. And this again, this is public information. You can get this. Now, midsummer really isn't prime time for walleyes on Lake Erie. They migrate to colder, deeper water where fish they eat, like yellow perch, have relocated too. Not to mention those 100 million walleye are all competing for food sources and spawning territory, making it difficult for Erie's trophy fish to follow the usual patterns they have for decades. To land a wall hanger, it's likely that we're gonna have to weed through all those smaller fish or think way outside the box. Ross is pretty good at that, so let's just hope those modifications we made yesterday help him get this job done. But just to get to the fish, We've got an eight mile offshore run ahead of us in a pretty chopped up Lake Erie. Okay, so Joe, here's what we're gonna do. We got a- You gotta tell me all the things to do because you know I don't do this. Like I'm kind of useless you here. You love walleye trolling. I, I, yeah, I know, I do. So, uh, we're, you know- So out of my element. We're not handicapped today, but we're doing things a little different because we, yep. we're gonna rely on the Minn Kota. Yep. Because we can't control our speed with that big motor good. So right. we're gonna do things kind of old school backwards. We're gonna start with these weights and I'm gonna let them out now that we've got our speed set where we're gonna kind of set. Yeah. And basically I'm going to work bottom up because I know where the bottom's at. So I'm gonna let this thing hit bottom and we don't wanna be on bottom, but we know there's a thermocline like five, six, seven feet. So we yeah. wanna be just above that. So I'm gonna see how much line it takes me to whack. And we're, correct me if I'm wrong, we're marking a pile of fish here. Yeah, there's a bunch of fish right in the bottom. Yeah. So, and you get that, it's not a thermal climb, but it's like a temperature break, right? Yep. And remind me, how do you know there's one on? It just bends over like kind of slowly and uninterestingly? Yeah, pretty much that's how you say it. And I, and, and I look at it like, well, it's because it's, it takes finesse. All right, outside board is going, Joe. Here we go. Okay, you, okay, Are you gonna again. hand them to me all day? Yeah. I just wanna point out that I hate having a rod with a fish on it handed to me. It's a pet peeve of mine. I have to get you're that frantic. Rod I dude, love it. God. You, you gotta, dude, you, you're not, we're, we're gonna have a bad situation here because you're not listening. Fact, I have been on a boat with a 600 pound blue marlin on the line and things were not as high tension as they are right now. So we got these lines. So we have to talk and communicate. A lot of people just out here and they're cranking and it's like, no, 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 no. So we've got this. So when we have to communicate, that's why I want you back here to begin with. I understand. Because we, we don't want to have that slack in there. I'm gonna do the best I can for you, bud. I wish you would take this board up here so I could feel the full so we're gonna power point, of this we're gonna, piece. You got rods in the way. Yep, you're gonna point right at them there. And I'm gonna bounce it up because we got 50 and 60 that are already rolled dirty. And actually that's Get the a second hapu, bite Marty. on it. You salt guys. Let me, let me get these out yeah. here. Let me get these out of your way. We're pulling night crawlers on spinner harnesses. And with so much line between us and the fish, the best way to make sure that walleye reaches the net is to just reel steadily at a snail's crawl. Really, barely moving. Rod, rod, rod this way, yep. Bar barely turning. No more turning, no more turning, no more cranking, just play it. Dude, donkey. Donkey! That's what you do. Atta boy. I knew you had it in you. We don't have time to talk about it. We have another one, Joe. We have another one. Counter. Counter. 62, 62. Okay. As much as I give you a hard time, you just get it done, dude. 
That second one was a little shaker that we lost, but I mean, that's a quality. That's a quality area. You know, here's a little story for you. The guy that I grew up with taught me the game. He was yeah. the best. When we catch those little ones, like we just did yeah, a really yeah, yeah. bad thing on, he goes, I love a fish that, that's the best eating size. And then I'd say, what about when we catch the big ones, Jim? And he says, I love a fish that can feed a family. <laughs> <laughs> that fish is bit. fat too, man, across the back. A lot of meat on that one. You want to take them out all smooth like, like this? Mm -hmm. Because slack is not your friend. So here's the deal. This looks like pandemonium. It and, is. And, and it is, because these fish don't bite forever. You get off these active pods. There's a lot of water out here. And to stay on the active pods, it's, it's, it's really tough. You know, you just got a whole lot of nothing out here. Yeah, I mean, because it's straight and narrow. We want to keep them on a straight line as much as humanly possible. Yep. Perfect. Dude, we're, we are already advancing right Communicating now. Communicating better. Yeah. OK, counter. 62. That number tells Ross how far behind that planer board that crawler harness was riding so he can reset it at the same depth. OK, really slow. Oh, dude. Oh, dude, that's a nice one. It's a good one. Nice. Dude. Nice. My man. Dude, these are not summer caliber fish. We just, we're going right to the donkey hall. <laughs> mm. All right. Yeah, buddy. The treble hook's down in there. Your best friend when you're spinner fishing. Because it's these little things that make a difference. You can get this hook out, hopefully, because it's in his stomach without damaging it. Right on. Big players, no dice. Yeah, bud. You know, blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. <laughs> when we rigged this and you were like, what are we taking this $500 transducer off for? We put that cheap little simple 2D on. Yeah. And we marked these fish on the way out. Yeah. And I'm like, swing up, swing up, because, you know, we marked a pile of a fish for a while. And, and we went through those pockets. And you just, you want to put yourself in front of the most amount of fish. I don't care what species you're doing or how you're going to fish yeah. them. But this is purely thermocline and temperature congregation. We're, we're not in rocks. We're not in a, a ledge. To clarify, we don't have a technical thermocline, but we're going to have a temperature break. Like, you would see a hard thermocline, but right. we have a temperature break at about 40 feet right now, between 40 and 45. Gotcha. So these fish are, generally speaking, going to be deeper because that's where the bait's at. Right. Everything is bait, bait, bait. When it comes down to it, fish don't go far from the grocery store. Right Again, on. regardless of what you're doing, that's, that's the thing to kind of always keep in mind. The bummer about planer boards is that you're fighting them more than the fish until they get unclipped at the boat. But without them, we couldn't be this effective. Planer boards pull your lines off to the side. With them, we can cover a giant swath of water. Without them, we'd be fishing an area only about as wide as the boat. Counter. 64. Ross likes to run his shallowest lines way on the outside and have them get progressively deeper as they come in. Like you, I know you guys are salt guys, and I love salt fish, but this is like primo eat, man. All right, all right. OK. In the box. Ooh. You all right, bro? Oh, I got a rod and reel in the water. Things we, just got real. Yeah, if we lose it, we lose it. That's why you threw both. We talked about this, and it happened. I'm not going to say what you think I'm going to say, which was how you were like, no matter what you do, don't lean on the trees. I really didn't, but I did, obviously. It's a little soft in there. It's kind of it's a little soft. This just made you so real, though. This made you just so mortal. You're so immortal to all, all your followers, all your raw. That's not the Ross Robertson everybody knows and loves right there. You just humanized yourself. It is what it is. Oh, my gosh. We could have patched things up and gotten back on the troll, but honestly, we had a phenomenal morning and put enough walleyes on ice to feed ourselves and every member of the Wu-Tang Clan. So we called it quits and headed back to the dock to start cutting. I also have to say that while walleyes aren't my first love, behind all the ribbing I give Ross is a deep respect for his skills. This is a game of feet and inches, finesse, and decades of dedication. And if you gave me all his gear, I certainly couldn't come out here and just instantly dial it all in. Luckily, Das Boat did everything we needed it to do. The rod holders allowed us to fish multiple rods at once. The extra batteries let us use the trolling motor to achieve proper trolling speed all day. And that $50 transducer marked those walleyes even when we got the old Mako up on plane. This is my interpretation. Tell me if I'm wrong. When I break it down, I look at what you're doing. 
The thing you're striving for is the eat. It's the getting those harnesses, those lures in the part of the column where they have to be at the right speed. It's because it's not the fight. You're not catching them because they brawl. It's, so to like, me, I would argue that catching big walleyes because of how they are. They're freakish. Mm -hmm. They're hard to find. They don't locate. They don't act anywhere near the same. What it takes to catch a big walleye, I would argue, is as difficult as most species I've been around. I haven't fished the entire world to say that, but like, what is the defining moment in trophy walleye fishing? Like, what is your moment? What is the thing that it's like, this is it? This is the reason I do this. To consistently catch big walleyes, you've got to do things different, and you've got to be pretty up on your game because it's the little, little details. You know, when you're catching four pound walleyes at will, the average guy is happy with that. But me, I'm like, okay, what can I do to catch an eight or 10? Because I know they're here. Five years from now, though, are you still the best walleye fisherman on Lake Erie? I don't know that I am now. But do you think you are? I think everybody has to think that they're one of the best. I like being just in the conversation, Joe. The wind the next day kept us off the big lake and the walleyes, and I was obviously heartbroken. But thankfully, despite what Ross thinks, there's a lot more to catch here than walleyes. And I can't think of a better send off for Das Boat or a better way to irritate Ross than some good old fashioned catfishing on sheltered Sandusky Bay. So Joe, I don't know if I've ever been guided in my own home waters. I, I hesitate to call what I'm doing right now guiding you. Yeah, then I just, that, I, just fish for, I just fish for catfish more than you do, that's all. Look at that. Oh. Shrimp all around, great catfish bait, right? So we're gonna put out, we'll do two shrimp. And then I got a special mix here. Sometimes this is killer, sometimes not, but I like having a variety of baits on a catfish. I made you, you know what that is? That's cherry Kool-Aid garlic hot dogs, cheap hot dogs. You know I get hungry, but that's ridiculous. Mm. Now see, I love this. This is relaxing. Nobody's yelling. You just drop a chunk of meat behind the boat, maybe crack open a nice cold four loco and wait for the damn rod to bend over. Oh yeah, fishy, fishy. Let, oh. him, let him bend it. Real, 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 real. You got him, you got him, bud. So I've done a lot of blue cat fishing on the James River in Virginia. So you have big blues in these channel cats. And the guys I fish with down there, the good old boys are like, don't jump for a tap, just let them tap. The one you want is gonna bend it and it's not gonna come back up. Right. Congratulations. <laughs> it's still, I should. Hot dog, hot dog, hot dog. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nut this myself. Nerd him. Well, this one only has one eye, no wonder I caught him. You know, I find, a lot I of find most channel them? cats only have one eye, actually. Are you kidding me? No, dude, I catch them one eyed all the time. Come on, Ooh, hot you're dog. You're back right, back right, back right. Oh, that's the hottie dog. Nah. That's good, clean American fun right there. Mm. See, you can actually real quickly bend the rod, <laughs> pump it if you want. You can catfish. pump it if you want. They've got one Nothing's eye. Nothing's gonna happen. They got one eye and a hard mouth. You, you can't, you you can't fail. Whatever you want. Look at that. Look at that, dude. Joe, I've been fishing catfish for like 10 minutes, and I have one. I'm holding it like a loaf of bread. That's one of the biggest ones I've caught, actually. Look at the head on that thing. Dude, come on, that is fun. There she goes. Oh. <laughs> Look is this that. a mic drop? Grab that. Is this a mic drop? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I'm starting to reconsider things. Come on, man. Whiskers Guide Service. Whiskers Guide Service. Big water whiskers. Ginger whiskers. <laughs> I still like this boat. I have a soft spot for this boat. Oh, right. This is fitting, though, and I'll tell you why. Because if you think about all the things this boat has done, it's done a lot of technical fishing. Walleye, cobia, chasing stripers around. Like, the whole point of DOS boat is that you don't need like this really fancy, expensive boat to get out there and fish. So I, I just think it's so fitting that we're ending on just like the most American thing, just anchored up on hot dogs and shrimp, catching channel cats. Nothing technical about it, just fun fishing. I'm gonna miss this boat, just like I've missed every boat I've ever gotten rid of. But what you remember most about boats isn't the fish you put on deck. In the end, they don't matter. It's the people you spent time with on that deck. You remember the adventures, the shenanigans, the holy shit, I can't believe that happened moments, and the remind me never to do that again moments. Take it from me. Boats are a pain in the ass, but that boat is your pain in the ass. Nothing beats cruising in your own rig. And if there's one thing I hope DOS Boat has proven, it's that you don't have to be rich, and your girl doesn't have to be the prettiest one at the dance to create those moments you'll never forget.